right, um, we've got a packed schedule for you guys today, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us for this very important discussion today about data. My name is Kim Thompson. I'm the director of the Aquarium of the Pacific's Seafood for the Future program. I'm very fortunate to have been invited to work with this very forward thinking group of researchers on a project that was awarded funds from NOAA Sea Grant in 2019. Our goal was to study marine aquaculture data and policy to support sustainable marine aquaculture development in the United States. The results of this research have yielded some interesting findings, including inconsistency and uncertainty in how marine aquaculture data are collected and shared. They also revealed a broad diversity of policies concerning marine aquaculture development across coastal states. Understanding the current status of the aquaculture industry in terms of production and policy is essential to sustainable development of the industry. And it's also essential for farms to succeed and be financially sustainable. Many of you saw this firsthand when you applied for COVID relief. Many of you also participated in a survey that we circulated earlier this year. And on behalf of this team, I wanna thank you all for taking the time to complete that survey. We will be sharing some of those results with you later in this webinar. So if I can get my screen to, yeah. Um, so here's the agenda. Um, and before I introduce our speakers, I wanna go over some brief instructions to help facilitate a more productive discussion. And I wanna emphasize that we do want this to be a discussion, so please don't be shy about engaging. You may have noticed we did disable the comments section. However, we do encourage you to use the Q&A uh, section to ask questions and to comment. And while we won't be answering questions until the end, please do feel free to add questions or comments as they come to mind during the presentations. Please also note that you can vote up a question by clicking the thumbs up icon in the bottom left hand corner of a question. If someone asks a question similar to what you had planned to ask or you like the question and want to increase the chances of it being asked in the time that we have, please feel free to vote it up. We will do our best to answer as many of the questions, as many questions as we can in the time that we have. But for those that we do miss, we will provide summary responses along with the recording of this webinar to all who have registered sometime next week. Okay, now let's meet our speakers. Now, in the interest of time, you can see the full team here, but I'm only going to introduce the teammates who will be speaking with us today. Uh, first up, we have Dr. Holly Froelich, uh, Assistant Professor at UC Santa Barbara's Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology. Dr. Sarah Lester, Assistant Professor at Florida State's Geography Department. May Rennick, a PhD student at UC Santa Barbara's Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Marine Biology. Kaylee Limwen, a PhD student at Florida State's Geography Department. And Dr. Rebecca Gentry, a postdoctoral researcher at Florida State's Geography Department. And once again, here's that snapshot of our jam packed agenda. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Froelich to get us started. Holly. Great, thank you, Kim. Let me go ahead and okay. So we're going to start off first with a little bit of context setting, and then we're going to go ahead and go through the various sections today of our webinar. So I think most of the people that are in this proverbial room are on board that seafood in the United States is changing. Whether that's increase in consumption, both domestically or internationally, definitely related to that is the growth in aquaculture that is definitely filling much of that gap based on the stabilization of our global fisheries, which is very in kind to kind of the stabilization that we see in the United States as well. There's also new policies coming on board, both targeting, targeting aquaculture, but other aquatic aspects, including that of climate change, which we're already seeing the impacts on both our fisheries and aquaculture and anticipating that that is going to continue into the future. And of course, globalization, which is interacting and influencing many of these components, including our domestic access to seafood, from imports therein. And of course, technology, 
both influencing how we produce our food and of course, the other side of things of how we monitor and oversee it as well. But for the webinar today, we're gonna to be looking through an aquaculture lens. And in particular, focusing on marine aquaculture. So many of the speakers on the webinar today have contributed to various arrays of research, kind of looking at the potential for marine aquaculture, including this paper by Rebecca Gentry and others, including myself, um, which looked across the world and um, using kind of conservative modeling and estimates found a lot of potential for marine aquaculture. In this case, you're looking at thin fish production um, and the potential uh, opportunities for best growth or really good growth. But we're not the only ones. There are a suite of other researchers that have come to the same conclusion that a small fraction of the most suitable area can produce lots of seafood. But if we look at the United States aquaculture production sector, what we see is that it ranks about 17th in the world and marine aquaculture is part or just a fraction of that calculation. So why is that? There have been high level national evaluations of this, a few case studies, um, and there's been some reports identifying that growth is hampered by opaque or cumbersome regulations and policies. Now, of these 23 coastal states, however, there hasn't been a really deep dive in comparison for each individual state featured here. And so that's one of the things that we wanted to seek out of how do all these marine states compare, both from a data perspective and policy perspective, and are there lessons to be learned, both in the heterogeneity or similarities that we see across these states. So today we're going to walk you through kind of four major components um, of our research. First highlighting is starting with our data synthesis approach and we'll dive into why focus on just the data, um, at least initially. We'll then provide additional context into that why by highlighting two case studies in association with the data synthesis approach, both in California and then Florida. We then will move into the policy synthesis work, which absolutely connects to uh, the data realm and vice versa. And really focusing on the evaluation of looking again across those 23 coastal marine states and specifically enabling policies. And then we'll end our webinar, um, then we'll move, before we move into uh, question and answer, we're gonna talk about future needs and next steps, including some of that um, survey results that um, Kim mentioned. So starting on the data side of things, I could stand here and show you a bunch of papers and why it's super important using something like wild fisheries to talk about that. Um, but instead, what I'm going to do is just read this quote from a policy and governance technical report from the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations on fisheries and aquaculture. Okay, so this is based on policy and governance. And the statement reads, quote, sustainable aquaculture is severely handicapped where there are insufficient data or where the data are unreliable. In fact, data are essential for informed decision-making in aquaculture, yet this aspect is often overlooked. And so this is at the core of why we're starting out in data. So let's walk through what type of data is available currently? And then we'll start kind of slogging through um, the aspects of comparing those data. So starting with the United States Department of Agriculture, this is certainly the most comprehensive and large scale evaluation uh, for publicly available aquaculture information. Now this is based on an aquaculture census this is an offshoot of the agricultural census that is implemented about every five years. The data will come out every five to eight, the timestamps you can see here. Um, and it's around freshwater aquaculture and some marine aquaculture, which you'll see why I say that. And importantly, the source of this information are directly from farms and operations. We then have some information around marine aquaculture from NOAA fisheries as well. 
Now, these are regional or semi-annual reports or highlights, and it's only focused on marine aquaculture. And an important aspect of this is that while the regional information is provided, uh, the state level data is not publicly available. In addition, this is the data that you would see if you use the Food and Agriculture Organization's data um, from their, their data frame. So that's where the connection is there. And in terms of sources, instead of directly from the farmers or op operations, um, these are aggregated and collected seemingly from agencies and other organizations. And then last but not least, we have our, what we're gonna be calling the state solicited data uh, throughout the rest of this section of the talk, where again, it's coming from individual state agencies and organizations collecting through uh, the process mandated or not by the state. Um, and this is a mixed bag of availability. And of course, these things potentially are interacting and influenced from each other. However, there hasn't been a really kind of deep dive and assessment across these data sources to identify those potential inconsistencies or sources of error and where the opportunities lie to really set up a solid foundation moving forward for marine aquaculture, especially with the um, anticipation and interest in its growth. So we're first going to start and kind of walk through some of the information from USDA. Again, the most comprehensive and complete um, that we that we are able to access at the state level. Um, we're then going to walk through the state solicited data, and then we'll go ahead and compare all three. So starting with you, USDA, I'm actually going to show you some of what seems to be the most complete forms of information that USD, USDA provides, that of number of farms and area. So what you're looking at here is the snapshot from 1998 of what is the composition or makeup of the various production systems in the number of farms. So the coloration patterns that you're viewing is whether or not a state has the majority of them being marine farms will be shown in yellow. If the majority are freshwater farms, it's shown in purple. And what you'll notice by and large, freshwater rules in 1998. Of course, individual states vary a lot in terms of that contribution and those calculations. Um, and that will be a theme throughout the rest of these talks. Uh, so for instance, Florida reported at this time over 200 farms. Uh, while Louisiana reported anywhere between one to four and California around 20. But if we fast forward to 2018, a really important feature emerges. We see a consistency across both the number of farms and acreage that marine aquaculture is increasing and it's growing in its importance. So again, remember if the majority of farms are now marine, then that's what's gonna highlight in yellow. And what we find is that, yes, we see about a 66% increase in the number of farms since 1998 and a 71% increase in acreage. But importantly, again, there is a diversity and array of differences depending on the states. And so the reason those are popping out could be very different from one to another. For instance, again, Florida had an actual reduction in the number of farms, whereas Louisiana saw a near 25 fold increase in the number of farms, while California has remained the same. But as we start diving in a little deeper into the USDA data, we start seeing some differences and some missing information that is certainly um, somewhat uh, highlighted within the frameworks or um, caveats of the collection methods and agencies themselves, but we're trying to provide a more complete picture by looking at this and across the various data sources. So what you're looking at here is the value information. This is kind of the next step down of kind of most complete, as I mentioned. Um, the value information is associated with each individual time step that I mentioned on the x-axis in year. Um, on the y-axis are the categories that are could be marine farmed species or taxonomic groups that are aggregated by the USDA. The value then is depicted in that coloration pattern in millions of US dollars. The warmer the color, the more valuable. So we see things like oysters and clams increasingly becoming more valuable over time. However, things start to get a little, little hairy when we start trying to pull out other aspects, like for instance, volume and specifically for marine aquaculture, remember. 
So what you're looking at here is the complete set um, of volumetric information that is available through USDA. Specifically, there was only one year that there is marine volume data. Again, the coloration patterns are indicating, um, in this case, tons. Warmer colors indicate more production. So we only have one year. And in addition to that, there are inconsistencies across um, the, the value and volume data as well. So for instance, if we look at the CLAM column here in 2005, we have some reporting of value, but not volume. Why is this important? Well, some base econometrics of understanding what's driving changes in something like value, we can't say without the volume. So if volume, if value increases or decreases without volume, we can't know whether that's market driven or it's just volumetric or production driven or both. And in addition, the actual kind of species correspondence kind of highlights this as well. Um, so looking across each individual state, again, lots of heterogeneity there, uh, we actually see a fourfold difference in the number of species or taxonomic groups per state um, if we do that comparison. And so that really motivated the next step of trying to get better understanding of what's going on at the state level. And I, by no means are we the only people that have this kind of information, but we were trying to aggregate it and collect it um, to under, get a better understanding of where these potential deficits are for moving forward. And so starting actually with input um, from NOAA of some, some um, agencies and organizations and individuals we could reach out to to try to get better state information, we spent about a year and a half contacting and bugging um, nearly 50 or actually 50 plus experts um, to get some level of information for all 23 states. And we couldn't have done it without NOAA. We couldn't have done it with all of the people that um, were kind enough to respond to our information. So, so big, big props for the people that helped us create this data or at least collect it. And through this process, what we ended up with was this. Um, and by no means is it fully complete, as you'll see, but it does provide some new insights and snapshots into what is going on in marine aquaculture that you can't really see um, at the granularity with you, the USDA data. So for each individual taxonomic group, you'll see an individual plot. On the y-axis um, is the state. On the x-axis, it's the year. Notice much greater uh, range in terms of, of time. Um, and in this case, it's volume information, yay, which we didn't have in the other case. Um, we also collected value data, but I'm just showing you the volume data here. So important things emerge now that we have this information. So for instance, through this process, we were able to find that volume started as early as 1962 in one of the pieces or longest time series that we could find in Washington state. We're also able to put seaweeds on the map, which are missing from the USDA information, as well as find kind of a really interesting uh, pattern that may or may not be um, fully visible through the USDA data, which is that of the um, adoption of mollusk production pretty much in every single state um, by, by the recent time period now. And we get to see trends that start emerging between value and volume that again, we can't pull out um, in the other source. So for instance, across all the states that we evaluated, with this information, we found that only Florida and Louisiana showed evidence of declines in both value and volume, while the rest of states seemed pretty stable or increasing. And diverse, diversity of species or groups is even more apparent by just visual, visualizing this without even describing it. But what you're looking at here, um, again, is this kind of uh, time series of all possible descriptions of different species or taxonomic groups um, over time. The coloration patterns are a little different now. Um, instead of volume or value, they are that of the number of states that are producing that organism. So again, if we look at oysters, we see an increasing uptick um, of the adoption of oyster production. And notably, we identified 61 marine species or groups that have been farmed at some point. So much more diverse um, in terms of the range and uh, interesting things that are happening within the sector over time. 
on average, a given state, we're able to then calculate um, is around four organisms or four species or groups, excuse me, that are cultivated at any given point in a state. Uh, but we're able to identify these kind of extreme cases uh, as well, including Washington and Florida. We also see things like clams and finfish are actually the most diverse groups in terms of categorizations, but they're farmed in much fewer states versus something like oysters, which is quite consistent with the USDA data, um, being the most common, most valuable, et cetera. But again, value, money talks, so maybe that's really what you want me to compare now. So I'm gonna go ahead and walk through the comparison at the national level of the most recent data. While it would be lovely to compare across the entire time series, we can't really do that because there has been changes in how data are collected. Um, and obviously a lot of this is not necessarily fully complete. So we tried to focus on the most recent and complete pieces of information. So again, starting with USDA, if we look at 2018 valuation, um, they estimate around $537 million in, in total value of marine aquaculture of all of those organisms that, that I showed at the beginning. However, when you start again diving into the data, there are some inconsistencies across times, including states that were producing a lot with a lot of value in 2013, the previous time step, are completely absent. So if we correct for that and add in that value as a placeholder, we find that the value bumps up to 572 million. And again, volume information at this time is not available. So just straight out of the gate, we see a potential discrepancy of about $35 million. In comparison with NOAA, NOAA reports about $369 million um, in, in value and does have a report um, of a total estimate of about 37,000 tons. And then our efforts, which were only a year and a half, so by no means are we saying that we can even compete with the capacity, knowledge building, and kind of infrastructure that is laid into USDA and NOAA, but trying to build out that time series, we did a decent job of capturing about 220 million on average um, in total, and we actually captured more volume um, than, than NOAA. So discrepancies, again, between um, the various agencies, around 158 million, and ours, 149 million, um, obviously much greater with USDA. So again, you kind of start seeing these, these gaps in information, which do have important implications for valuation of the industry. And while we would love to, again, look across each individual state, we can only do that for the USDA um, and state solicited data that we collected. But we wanted to get a closer look because, like I said in the beginning, each individual state kind of has its own interesting idiosyncrasies and approaches that can allow us to perhaps understand the access and quality um, story a little better. So comparing the USDA to state solicited data, we looked specifically um, at that percent overlap. So what do I mean by that? So I'm just gonna walk you through and then I'll show you the rest of the information. So for instance, if we take Alabama, we compared uh, the state solicited valuation um, information we collected um, to that reported by USDA, and we found that we only captured um, about 10% or less for, for Alabama. So not, not great, we didn't do great. Um, but again, kind of across the board, a lot of diversity in, in our ability to capture, um, or at least match that of USDA, or even exceed that. So the the cooler colors out into the green, we see better alignment between um, the data sources. And in fact, we actually did um, above and beyond on four states, um, ranging between 150 to 880% more um, in terms of value. And one important thing we really want to note here um, is that trying to understand success and kind of approaches to data collection can be really challenging. Uh, but one thing to note is that of three of the states that have a uh, mandate on how to collect aquaculture data um, underlined here, 
they had and are in some of the best alignment um, between the state solicited data and USDA. So it could be an indication. Um, and specifically, these states use the uh, Regional Data Coordination Standard Atlantic Fisheries Information System that was, again, originally developed for wild fisheries, but has been um, re retrofitted um, and modified to be able to be applied to aquaculture. So, what we find is that USDA reports the highest value, but it appears that there is still kind of missing information um, that is no necessarily no fault of USDA in general. It's just kind of highlighting the importance and kind of opportunities moving forward. So in 2018, again, a report of 537 million. Through this process, we identified there's at least four to $35 million, and that's probably on the low end in terms of uh, the value of marine aquaculture in the United States, which you may be thinking, okay, well, that's a very small fraction of a $5 million uh, value. However, if you average across the states for each individual state value, what you find is that that's about the average value of a given state for marine aquaculture, right? So we may be missing an entire state's worth um, of value. In addition, we see about uh, a 23 versus 61 kind of species groups evaluation. So diversity ends up being really important too. And again, volumetric information largely missing. But up until this point, I haven't told you, well, why? Why are there differences? Um, and there are many. One big one is certainly confidentiality, but that's the law, right? Confidentiality ends up being really important. And so this kind of plagues all data sources, all approaches here. The other components though, is that we identified at least 15 sources of uncertainty or error. Um, and we don't really know which one is kind of driving any individual state. So everything from being part of uh, aquaculture being embedded in wild fisheries landings or vice versa, to just overall lack of participation, which these two you'll hear about a little bit more in the case study. And so in summary, what we find through this data process is that consistently across all three data sources is that marine aquaculture is playing an increasingly important role in the United States. That is a big takeaway from this research is that we were able to see that pattern emerge in various ways, shape or forms regardless of the differences across the data sources. However, that being said, that the state level data are highly uncertain. And that's inherently problematic, not just from a data nerd scientist like myself, but that it really is probably um, resulting in a much lower reporting of diverse and value, um, diversity and value in this sector. And one thing that we kind of landed on and found is that one feasible first step towards better data may be leveraging the existing infrastructure of a regional state federal cooperative program like the one that I mentioned, the standard Atlantic fisheries information system, alongside something like the Atlantic Coast cooperative statistics program that was built up for wild fisheries. And last but not least, You'll notice that we didn't include the territories um, in these evaluations, and that was mainly just due to time, but we think that this would be a massive added value of including um, these, these territories as well. And so with that, I will then pass it off to May Rennick to now talk about the California case study. Thank you, Holly. Um, like she mentioned, my name is May. I'm actually a graduate student in her lab, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about the California case study aspect of this project, which I have taken the lead on in order to um, identify some of the interactions between aquaculture and fisheries on a finer scale. Specifically, I was interested in looking at how changes in fisheries might be affecting the development or the design of aquaculture within the state. And for one aspect of this project, the question I was asking was how instability in the fishery sector or drastic declines in fisheries production might correspond to aquaculture growth or development through time. So to break that down, my approach to this was just to plot out fisheries production and aquaculture production 
and then look through fisheries production to see major declines, see where um, it crashes and identify when in time that was happening. And hypothetically, when this happens, one of three things can occur. Production can either stay low until it recovers um, or it can become, the sector can become diversified. So they can pivot to a different, different similar type of seafood item or um, build up a different aspect of the sector until that um, sector which is, cr which is crashed can return. Thirdly, um, we can expand to alternative sectors, which includes aquaculture and was particularly what we were interested in. So we were interested to see if these crashes in fisheries would correspond to potential growth or development in the aquaculture sector. So I just started, like I said, by, um, and I would like to point out that Holly walked us through a lot of aquaculture data and I am now pivoting a little bit and we're gonna be looking at wild caught fisheries data and we'll get back to aquaculture data in just a second. And I'm also fo focusing on mollusks because in California, that is the only aquaculture that we have. So I started by plotting out um, the wild caught fisheries production in California. And as I looked closer, I started to notice a few discrepancies. For example, if you look at mussels, which is this line down here, we're producing at near zero and consistently through time. And if you look at oysters, which is up here, you see a big crash post 1980s, but aquaculture had already made a complete blue transition from uh, wild caught fisheries to solely aquaculture production far prior to the 80s, which suggests that there was either a change in policy or um, a change in reporting that causes this crash and not necessarily a shift in production. So I was interested in looking at that a little bit further. So here is our oyster data. Um, and in order to look at it further, I started gathering different data sources to see if one might um, highlight challenges in the other or vice versa. So you can see that the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and NIMS data is relatively similar until that same around the 1980s breakoff point. And then we see this data continue on and this data bottom out to zero. Um, again, we know that there is no wild fisheries um, production happening during this time. So something's a little off. So I decided to map the available aquaculture data on top of this to see if like Holly was talking about, that binning is occurring. Um, and we do see that this production in aquaculture is sitting ar around where NIMS is reporting, but also we don't have aquaculture data until pri um, prior, or sorry, not prior, till previous to when this is all occurring. So it's very uncertain as to where these discrepancies are occurring and um, it is very hard to identify these transitions that I was interested in looking at in production data um, due to the nature of these sources. So while I would really like to extend a thank you to so many individuals and agencies which were beyond helpful to me in procuring all this data and locating it, there is um, some work to be done still. So um, I, moving forward, better defining and delineating between marine aquaculture production and fisheries production and defining both could improve the reporting of the data. Um, developing consistency amongst agencies and how and where this um, data is reported and kept would certainly improve, um, like I said, the consistency. And then making the data easily accessible sounds like such um, an easy thing, but um, as we noted of 1.5 years of trying to collect all of this data, um, some of the data is really hard to get our hands on and could make a big difference in creating policy to govern these things. So, oh, please. 
Moving forward, I'm going to introduce Haley Lim Wen. She is a graduate student working on the California case study of this project. And I'm going to pass it off to her to tell you more about it. Thanks, May. Uh, as May said, I am a second year PhD candidate at Florida State University in Dr. Lester's lab. And I'm going to chat briefly about the Florida case study associated with this research. Really quick, um, I wanted to thank the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, or FDACS, and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation, Conser Conservation Commission for all their help tracking down and understanding the data that we needed for this. So similar to the California case study, for the Florida case study, we are interested in looking at interactions between aquaculture and fisheries namely how the development of shellfish farming was or was not influenced by shellfish fishing. So the specific questions that we asked to get at this include, how does shellfish aquaculture expand in time and space across Florida? Has shellfish aquaculture expanded directly in response to declining fisheries? And if so, how do fisheries collapses or restrictions open up opportunities for shellfish aquaculture? So the Florida shellfish aquaculture industry is thought to have started um, with the culturing of hard clams in the Indian Lagoon, the Indian River Lagoon on the east coast of Florida in the mid 20th century, though the first lease actually dates back to 1930 to an area just north of there. And then the industry was formalized in 1984 um, through state statute, which created 10 year leases. Before that, all leases were given in perpetuity which actually continued for about a decade after the statute until uh, FDAX was established. Today, uh, farm shellfish in Florida is a growing industry. Um, in the graph, you can see there's been an increasing, an increasing amount in the total acreage dedicated to shellfish farming in Florida um, over the last decade. And this is a trend that holds true for the total number of shellfish leases given out in this time period. And both of those contribute to an overall value in in the um, overall increase in the value of Florida shellfish, farm shellfish. In Florida, this is an industry dominated by small businesses. The vast majority of parcels are between two and five acres with the average parcel size for a farm being about three acres. Now multiple parcels can be associated with a single lease, but looking at the data, um, nearly every single lease is associated with a single parcel. So the average farm size is currently about three acres. Additionally, there are 732 active shellfish leases right now in Florida, and that includes 46 in perpetuity leases. Um, and this is spread out across 385 individuals or combinations of individuals. So there's a lot of people involved in this industry. And finally, as has already been mentioned about aqua, marine aquaculture generally, shellfish aquaculture in Florida is a very important component of the aquaculture industry overall. It makes up the largest food food use aquaculture industry in Florida, and about a quarter of all certified aquaculture farms are dedicated specifically to shellfish in Florida. So this graph shows um, both the wild and the farmed harvest for shellfish in Florida between 2016 and 2019. So state data for wild harvest uh, shellfish exists back to 1986, and prior to that, you can collect it from nymphs. But farmed production data uh, provided by the state only exists from about 2016, which is why this is the time period shown. But even with this small time frame, you can see that there's an interesting complementary pattern occurring between um, wild shellfish, which is shown in the dashed lines, and farm shellfish shown in the solid lines for both clams in red and oysters in blue. So many of the challenges and needs that we found in the Florida case study were also mentioned by the respondents in the survey that we're going to be sent out and we're going to talk about shortly. But the primary challenge that we encountered for Florida was a general lack of long term data. Now it's my understanding that the focus of aquaculture data collection in Florida was designed for use in a regulatory capacity, not for a long term trend analysis or for the creation of policy designed specifically to support industry. There's also no social data. Part of the lack of complete and consistent data collection is due to the fact that the state census is voluntary. 
Also, FDAX, the uh, department that's in charge of aquaculture in Florida, is subject to the Freedom of Information Act, um, though I'm told they're working on an exemption. So my impression is that the focus of data collection right now is on ensuring the confidentiality of personally identifiable information from participants before other changes will be made. Nevertheless, um, the specific data needs that we identified for Florida, which are consistent with many other states, um, include the need for consistent data collection and especially long-term data storage for purposes beyond just regulation. To do this, there needs to be increased buy-in from industry in support of data collection, which will likely require a guarantee in anonymity and confidentiality of personally identifiable information from the industry. And with that, uh, Dr. Lester is going to talk about our policy synthesis. All right, thank you, Haley. Um, there we go. Um, okay, so now you've um, heard a lot about challenges with data consistency, data access, how comprehensive the data are. And these are all the challenges that accompany trying to do a complete accounting of mariculture output, whether that be sales value or production volume or other important metrics. And now I wanna to pivot to a somewhat similar gap in terms of our lack of a comprehensive accounting of mariculture policy in the United States. Okay, so we know from research in other parts of the world and for other food production sectors that effective governance can be really critical for supporting the development of new industries and supporting the productive output of existing industries, mariculture included. Now in the US, the vast majority of existing marine aquaculture production occurs in state waters, which means mariculture is currently largely regulated by state policies and governance. However, despite the concentration of mariculture under the jurisdiction of the states, as we began this research, we realized we did not have a holistic understanding of the status of state level mariculture regulations and policies in the US. And there's really been no sort of detailed research attempting to understand how different state policies and governance may be enabling or impeding industry development across the US. And so to address this gap for this part of the project, we synthesize state level mariculture governance, <clears throat> categorizing and documenting a range of attributes of governance for aquaculture broadly and then mariculture specifically. And this included state legislation policies and initiatives, regulatory frameworks, and various types of management structures. And we assess these governance attributes for the same 23 coastal marine states that Holly focused on for the data synthesis. And we validated the information with aquaculture experts in each state. And so I wanna thank any of you listening today who assisted with this effort. Now governance is obviously very multifaceted. And so we really focused our synthesis um, on what we hypothesized could be enabling mechanisms for potential mariculture. So measures that could support sustainable development or reduce existing barriers to development. And so I wanna spend a few minutes talking through the types of attributes that we assessed and documented because we hope this compilation of governance information will be a, a useful resource for many of you listening today. Sorry, okay. So we assessed whether states had an overarching aquaculture development act or similar type of comprehensive legislation intended to support the development of aquaculture. So we assume that comprehensive enabling legislation signals a state's intent to support aquaculture development and can simplify and clarify the permitting and regulatory process for farmers. Now, if a state uh, did have such legislation, we also assessed whether it included specific provisions for marine aquaculture. And if a state did not have such legislation, we looked for um, the existence of more piecemeal enabling legislation for marine aquaculture that might be filling a similar role. We also assessed whether there were specific regulations regarding marine aquaculture leasing under the assumption that such regulations provide certainty and some degree of tenure security to the industry. We determine whether there are state government initiatives, policies, or programs specifically aimed at enabling aquaculture. 
So um, as examples, this could include programs designed to, designed to prof, provide funds or loans to offset the initial costs of starting a farm or programs to provide training to potential farmers. We identified whether there's a government provided aquaculture best management practices document. So this could be best management practices that were produced by the government um, or officially endorsed by the government. And we assume that such guidance can help facilitate sustainable growth and also clarify expectations for aquaculture permitting. When there was a best management practices document, we also assess whether it had specific guidance for marine aquaculture. We assessed whether uh, each state has spatial zoning specifically for marine aquaculture. Um, this can be referred to as aquaculture enterprise zones or approved aquaculture areas. And this could be statewide or for a portion of the state. And we presume that creating specific zones for aquaculture can proactively encourage development, help address conflicting uses, and potentially streamline the permitting process. Now we determine whether there's an easily identifiable email address or phone number for inquiries regarding marine aquaculture um, on a government website for the state agency that has oversight over marine aquaculture. Um, and that's because this would signify that the public or prospective farmers can easily find a contact if they have questions or need assistance. Finally, we assess whether there's a state provided regulatory guidance for marine aquaculture development. So this could take the form of a document that outlines the regulatory process or a checklist outlining the key steps for permitting and regulatory approval um, as just a couple of examples. Now, in addition to these enabling factors, we also examined some other attributes for which we had less clear expectations for whether they might enable or even hinder development, but we thought they might be useful to catalog. So this includes whether states right to farm statute applies to aquaculture. So all states within the US have right to farm laws to protect farmers against nuisance, lawsuit, nuisance lawsuits filed by um, nearby property owners or the public but not all of them explicitly apply to aquaculture or include aquaculture in their definition of agriculture. And so we cataloged which states um, do. We also assessed whether any types of aquaculture or farm species are not legal to farm or are subject to a moratorium, such as maybe a prohibition on farming fin fish and net pens. And the idea here was that um, such uh, such rules may constrain or limit aquaculture development. We also examined whether the same agency had jurisdiction over freshwater and marine aquaculture, and similarly, whether the same agency had authority over marine fisheries and marine aquaculture. And our thinking here was that having a single agency regulating these different seafood sectors could improve coordination or knowledge transfer between the sectors. But on the other hand, having a dedicated agency just focused on marine aquaculture could provide more specialized attention or signal that marine aquaculture is a top priority um, in that state. And then last but not least, we examine whether there's a government policy or strategy focused on climate change impacts mitigation or adaptation that includes considerations for aquaculture. So it doesn't need to be solely focused on aquaculture but we were looking for some evidence that the state is looking to support the industry in being more resilient to impending climate impacts. Now we found a lot of variability among states when examining these governance attributes. So the, the most common attribute is leasing regulations for marine aquaculture, 91% of states have that. And the least common of the enabling characteristics is government provided best management practices for aquaculture, only about a quarter of states have that. Um, about half of states have an Aquaculture Development Act or comprehensive legislation that's intended to, to formalize and support aquaculture development. But most of the states that do not have that attribute, so nine out of the 12 states that did not have the um, sort of overarching Aquaculture Development Act, do have more piecemeal, piecemeal legislation that is supportive of marine aquaculture. Uh, we found that climate change policy was very rare, so only three states had that. And then we uh, lastly found that agency jurisdiction over marine aquaculture is commonly consolidated with that of freshwater aquaculture and uh, with that of wild fisheries, so about 
three quarters of states in both of those cases. And in about half of the states, all three of those seafood sectors are managed by the same agency. Now we also combined the enabling governance attributes into an enabling governance score, just making some really simple assumptions about the relative importance of the different attributes. And the results are shown here on this map where a higher enabling governance score is shown in deeper shades of red. You can see there's no real striking geographic pattern. Uh, New Jersey received the highest possible score of eight. My current home state of Florida scores relatively high with a six. And the average score across all the states was a 4.7 out of eight. And then we looked at whether this score um, predicts various measures of mariculture output using data from the most recent uh, USDA census of aquaculture that Holly talked about from 2018. And here are those relationships, plotting the governance score against number of farm species, number of marine farms, marine farm acreage, um, and sales value. And each one of the points on those graphs represents an individual state. And there's really no relationship between farm acreage and enabling governance. Uh, the other three metrics of mariculture output show positive associations with enabling governance but there's a lot of scatter around those relationships and none of them are statistically significant. And that's also true when you control for coastline length um, because we recognize that these states really vary in how much coastal space they have available for potential marine aquaculture development. Um, so it looks like the relationship between enabling governance and mariculture is complex and perhaps weak, although we also know that these mariculture data are incomplete as, as Holly described in detail, making it quite difficult to robustly test, test these relationships. We also looked at some of the metrics of mariculture output by the presence or absence of some of the individual governance attributes. So here we're looking at um, number of species and number of farms. And we found that an easily identifiable government contact for marine aquaculture, government provided best management practices, and right to farm legislation that applies to aquaculture were positively and significantly associated with some of the metrics of mariculture output. So for example, states that have best management practices documents had a significantly higher number of farms than states that did not have uh, BMPs. Although I, I should also note that we can't really say anything about cause and effect for any of these variables. So, you know, as one example, best management practices could facilitate mariculture development, or alternatively, when you have extensive marine aquaculture development, that could prompt the creation of official best management practices. And we can't really distinguish between those two hypotheses. Now, while the relationship between enabling governance and mariculture development is, is complicated and, and possibly equivocal, um, you know, I think that this compilation of governance information could be a really useful resource to state management agencies and other entities that are working to support or guide mariculture development. And so this is just a screenshot from the governance catalog that we've developed. It's just an Excel spreadsheet right now, but it has web links to all of the laws and policies and relevant, relevant documents for each one of those attributes. And we plan to make this resource freely accessible. And so I think this synthesis gives a, you know, a diverse set of examples of mariculture governance, which could provide a useful template that could inform individual state governance going forward, or even potentially the development of an overarching federal policy or coordinating mechanism that attempts to link this sort of collective patchwork of state aquaculture governance approaches. So in conclusion from this part of the work, um, you know, we found that states have really diverse governance approaches that are guiding marine aquaculture development and the relationship between governance and mariculture output is complex, um, but also difficult to, access, uh, uh, to assess um, in part because of some of the data issues that we talked about earlier on in the webinar. Um, our next steps for this part of the work is um, we're working on a peer reviewed publication that we hope to submit soon. Um, and then we'd also like to take the governance catalog that I showed you on the previous slide and turn it into a living policy database that's freely accessible, but also ideally, you know, user friendly with a nice web interface 
And importantly, we know that you know, mariculture is an evolving sector. And so state governance is likely to evolve and change over the coming years. And so it's going to be important to have this database updated regularly so it doesn't quickly become outdated. Um, however, this living database is not something that we have funding to implement from our existing Sea Grant award. Um, and so we're really interested in pursuing um, the funding or resources necessary to make this a reality. And we've also had some initial conversations with the Sea Grant Law Center as a potential partner on this effort. So this is something that we're excited to hopefully be able to work on uh, going forward. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Rebecca Gentry to talk about some of the future needs and, and next steps. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so we are nearly at the end of the presentation. I'm going to be walking you through the last section, and then we'll be getting to your questions. So thank you so much for your continued attention. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, our take home messages and the next steps. And first of all, um, we believe that better. Oh, hold on. All right, we're back to the right screen. Sorry about that. Um, so we believe that better accounting of data and policy matters to everyone, to farmers, to scientists, to managers, policymakers, and to communities. And there's lots of reasons for that that I want to highlight. First of all, to monitor successes, failures, and progress. Sarah provided a really good example by talking about the governance um, work that we've been doing. Um, we need better data to understand the effects of policy and governance changes and to see lots of other things to understand what's happening with the industry. Secondly, to understand the current status of a sector, um, to establish a baseline. There are lots of misconceptions about marine aquaculture and having a better understanding can be useful for everyone and make the industry more defensible. Also to set goals and targets for the future. It's impossible to figure out where we wanna be if we don't know where we are right now. Also to choose and more accurately measure sustainability metrics. We all want a sustainable mariculture industry, and it's good for industry to be able to demonstrate sustainability, good for communities and other stakeholders to understand how aquaculture interacts with the environment. Also to adaptively manage in the face of change, particularly climate change. Holly highlighted a lot of ways that the industry is changing, and if we want to be able to adaptively manage, we need to have a better accounting of, of data and of policy. So I want to take a minute right now to give two specific examples of how better data could be of immediate use. The first example comes from this project. The original goal of our research team was to look across all states and to see if and how aquaculture development at the state level changed in relation to instability in wild caught fisheries. However, as you have heard when we discussed state level case studies, we just didn't have good enough data to answer these questions. And so the graph here that I'm showing goes back to the Florida case study that Haley was talking about. And you can see the dotted line is showing wild caught fisheries data in Florida. The solid line here is showing aquaculture data. And as you can see, trying to look at these relationships when we only have this, this small amount of data overlap is really just impossible. Um, so we actually have changed tack a little bit and are still looking at these questions, but from a regional basis where we have better data, but getting state level data would allow a better long term state level data would allow us to answer questions like these. A second example is looking at the seafood industry and COVID-19. As many of you know, COVID hit the aquaculture industry very hard. Um, if you look at the slide here, we can see it hit many aspects um, through production, processing, markets, and distribution. We looked at quarterly surveys of aquaculture businesses in 2021 and found that nearly all 80 to 90% are port being impacted. And 90% indicated that federal, state, or local or association assistance would increase likelihood that their farm would survive. Researchers have found a disconnect between what aquaculture farmers needed and the support that they were able to get. In times of crisis, 
good, easily accessible data can help quantify impacts and changes. And so it'd be really important when things like this and disruptions to the industry happen. So we clearly think that better aquaculture data is really important. Um, but in order for any progress to be made with improving data collection, it needs to be a cooperative effort and reflect a diversity of viewpoints. In the absence of a federal mandate like there is for fisheries, we need to have state level buy-in in order to increase and make the data collection and accessibility much better. So, begin to under, so to begin to understand different perspectives on the state of marine aquaculture data, we sent out a, a brief survey a couple months back and we got the results back and have started to analyze them. And I'm gonna, just gonna share a sneak peek of them. Oh, sorry. Again, we advanced a little too fast. Um, so thank you to those of you that did respond to, your, to our survey. We really appreciate your help. And we got 125 responses from industry, government, NGOs, academics, the public, and from and these came from 26 different states. So it's quite a wide swath of responses. And here um, are the results from two questions. The first one asking about the adequacy of data and the second about the accessibility of data. And you can see we have a wide breadth of responses, um, but overall we're getting the impression that many people think that the current aquaculture data is not adequate and also not accessible, not as adequate or accessible as it could be or should be or would be desirable. The second question we asked was about priority data. And you can see that there's a wide swath of responses here. So people are interested in data from economic environment um, and production and social. All of these data seem to be really important. Um, so there, there's a lot of need out there for types of data. We also asked about what are the biggest barriers to collecting this data. And cost um, and capacity were two of the biggest problems. And so we see there's a lot of, a lot of need for this, but also some challenges in how we're going to get it. And one of the things that we are focused on is whether there are policy solutions that could help create more efficient and effective data collection. So one other question I'm gonna share with you is we asked about the current reporting burden and this question was aimed specifically at industry. <clears throat> and you can see the responses here that the responses we got show that industry feels there's already a pretty high burden on collecting data. And so I think one of the major challenges we have is trying to balance getting all of this data that people seem to think we need and we believe we need very much with not creating too high of a burden um, some of the ways we can do that is possibly using effective um, existing, existing frameworks and infrastructure that exists as, as Holly spoke about earlier in the presentation and lowering these infrastructure burdens. Also showing the utility of this data makes it seem more worthwhile and may make the burden seem a little bit smaller, but that's a big challenge for us going forward. So our next steps in this project is to publish the results in scientific journals from all of these different papers, and we are working on those right now. We also are gonna be holding a small targeted workshops. Um, and during these, we're gonna to try to develop a roadmap for how to achieve better aquaculture data. And we don't know exactly what form that's gonna take, but please take a look at how that's gonna, um, that will be coming out. And so please keep an eye open for it. And as Sarah mentioned, we also want to find a long-term home for the state-level aquaculture policy database. So those are some of our priorities um, into the future. So at that, I'm going to hand it back to Kim to answer some questions for you all. Thank you so much. All right. Um, thank you for those of you who are, who are still with us. Um, these were some great illuminating presentations. Um, I think, Sarah, if we could stop sharing the screen so everybody can pop up and answer the questions. Um, so the first question we have is, uh, and forgive me if I put your name, Josh Grabio. Um, can you actually unmute yourself and clarify um, this question? And I believe it is to Holly. 
Um, so the question reads, any insight in other, I'm, I'm assuming you mean other insight in terms of the data quality for other aquaculture products like stocking and bait, but I don't want to overassume. So if you can clarify what that means. I think I, I think I know what he's asking. Do you, Kim, do you so. got it? Okay, yeah. go for it. Yeah. So um, what I think Josh is highlighting is that there's many different forms of aquaculture. And we had a question kind of similar to this um, that I briefly, briefly had. Great. Um, so uh, the question about whether it's food, stocking, bait, et cetera, of the different forms of which aquaculture can um, be used, uh, in, especially in terms of accounting through the USDA data in particular. And this is actually one of the things that um, we highlighted as a potential source of error. Um, so being able to delineate between what is food production versus what is some other form of commodity production, while it is highlighted to some extent um, in the USDA information, how that compares um, across the board to the state solicited data or to um, the NOAA data remains to be seen. So it could be a bigger issue in some given states, but it is definitely um, a source of potential error and may explain a bit of that 150 million plus discrepancy between NOAA and USDA. So if NOAA is only accounting for landing data that are, are food fish, that would maybe explain some of that gap, but it's still quite big and, and, and likely doesn't explain all of it. Thank you, Holly. And Sarah, um, your question just got really popular. So the um, state governance calendar law that you shared, so you did mention that it doesn't quite yet have a home, but they're asking um, where can they follow up for access? So can you just talk a little bit about some of the preliminary conversations we've had about what we're gonna do with the catalog? Yeah, so we'll be submitting the um, paper to a peer reviewed journal um, like in the next couple of weeks and that Excel table that has all the links will be like a supplementary appendix. So once it gets accepted and published in a journal, that'll be freely available. Um, and, and you could also reach out to me um, directly. And, and once it's published, we'd be happy to share it. But you know, our vision is really to develop something that's a little more user-friendly and interactive. And then, like I said, gets updated, you know, I think at least annually would be nice. And so that's the that latter part is where we're, you know, looking for funding or resources to make that a reality. Um, so yeah, I, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, great. Um, and so this next question, so uh, Ashley, thank you for, there's a series of questions here. Um, I will say these are actually beyond the scope of the, the project, but I think there's one that Holly could touch on a little bit. Um, but just to give some context in case you can't see the Q&A. So the first question she asked is what is being done to change California's complicated laws on leasing um, to help overcome the barriers? So that one I'm going to direct to Holly in just a moment. So two of our other questions were how is the group overcoming issues to set best practices for sustainable growth and how are we incorporating First Nations traditional knowledge in sustainable aquaculture protocols? Again, all super important um, questions and topics that need to be addressed just beyond the scope of this project. But I think for the first one, what is being done to change California's complicated laws? Holly, you were actually deeply entrenched in one of the activities. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. Um, so Echo and Kim, kind of all those components end up being really important. And while we focused on kind of the data side, this is kind of the foundational kind of information that will be required um, to inform both now and into the future these types of aspects. So I just wanted to highlight that um, at first. The kind of second kind of follow up, while we're not going to be explicitly addressing um, many of those components in this particular project, um, what is being done is several organizations, including um, Kim's as well, working on projects of understanding where can we go um, and what are the major bottlenecks in California? And one way of doing that, um, and one thing that is occurring currently is the California Aquaculture Action Plan, um, which is being pushed forward and supported by the Ocean Protection Council and um, Sea Grant, California Sea Grant. I'm one of the PIs on that particular project. Um, and we just started, we're only a few months in, but part of that process will be kind of identifying future goals and targets, and what are the pathways that can, can achieve those things? 
a lot of that will be um, embedding and communicating and working with community members um, across fishers, farmers, tribes, um, just public interest in general, that will be part of that conversation. And of course, data will be very much part of that. Um, but moving forward in terms of leasing and California specific aspects, um, a lot of that will be at least somewhat addressed um, within the progress of the aquaculture action plan, um, which again, just started, but um, we have three years that we will be working on that. So definitely kind of keep an eye out um, for, for everything that's going to come out of that effort. It's a lot of exciting things going on in California. Um, so this one goes back to Sarah. Um, in the policy synthesis and state enabling attributes discussion, you had mentioned three states that examined climate change and how, so, so I think the question is, what were the three states that actually did have climate change policy and how might that affect aquaculture policy? Yeah, so the, the three states that at least that we were able to identify were Connecticut, Massachusetts, and Washington. And so all three of those states um, had some form of like aquaculture, I mean, um, sorry, climate change policy or climate change adaptation policy. Usually it was broader than just aquaculture. I think that's true for all three states. But then within that, you know, sort of strategy document or policy document, there were um, there was some specific attention to aquaculture as one of the, the sectors that will need to sort of adapt to climate impacts. Um, and I, you know, I would guess that going forward, we will see more states that um, have these types of strategies and that include aquaculture in them because it's certainly, you know, many parts of society, but that is certainly a sector that's going to need to to adapt to climate impacts and what that looks like will be different depending on where it is. You know, shellfish on the West Coast are gonna be dealing with acidification much sooner than shellfish on the Gulf Coast. And, but in the Gulf Coast, there's potentially increased hurricane impacts. And so, um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so I'll start this one with Polly, but um, if others in the group want to chime in, is there any interest in comparing state aquaculture policies to their wild fisheries policies, uh, some sort of proxy for how relatively developed state aquaculture po policies and industry are in each state? I will say yes, and I'm going to hand it over to Haley and May because that was actually part of the original intent, assuming we wouldn't have to put in as much effort as we did on the, the data aggregation, both on the policy and um, data side of things. And so that was definitely a conversation we had, um, but it was kind of sidelined a little bit of, of um, tangibility. But that being said, that is some effort that is going into the case studies themselves that were highlighted. So May or Haley, I don't know if you want to speak to that. I can speak to that. I'm doing a pretty deep policy dig right now. Um, so yeah, based on kind of the uncertainty around the data, I started digging into other metrics around how we can uh, measure development. So um, as Holly mentioned, we've been considering how policy might be shaping these industries. And I'm currently working on, in the interest of time, I kind of skipped over it, but um, I am working on a policy comparison between fisheries and aquaculture to kind of see where the discrepancies are and how it might be affecting development moving forward? Does that answer the question? I am interested in it. <laughs> Haley, do you have anything to add? Um, no, just that a similar thing is happening in, in Florida. For, for uh, case study. So uh, the next question is, probably Holly, uh, how do NOAA and USDA collect aquaculture data? Yeah, so um, we briefly touched on it in the introductory slide. Um, and so on the USDA side, they rely most heavily on the census approach, which is largely kind of mail-in um, applications to, to then fill out and return. Um, they do have follow-up efforts as well, where they'll have kind of phone calls um, as well as email endeavors and some potentially follow-up mail to fill in those gaps. And they actually have pretty high return. Um, I think it was around 80% um, in 2013 and around 90% or vice versa in terms of respondent rates um, of the census. And 
to be clear on who's responding, it's operations and farmers themselves um, for that data. So that's how the census um, is filled in. I also want to note um, on the USDA side, while we focused on marine aquaculture, which was the intent from the get-go, the freshwater side um, for the USDA is, is much more complete. It seems much more um, robust and they actually have um, added information on an annual basis because they have supplemental surveys um, that they do at an annual basis for trout and catfish. Um, so you have a, a definite difference in time uh, in the types of attention um, and information collected, which is slightly different um, for the marine sector versus freshwater. On the NOAA side, it's mostly um, from what we can tell and have been corresponding with NOAA about who gave us like the first um, foray and saving us time of um, who to reach out to for information. And it's a lot of existing kind of organizations, state level agencies um, and contacts to be able to, to aggregate or who have aggregated that information and provide that data. Um, so we had very similar contacts um, and approaches to NOAA. And then we kind of branched out when we kind of hit up against any walls for the state solicited and collected data that we tried to recreate. Okay, um, so this question is, when comparing aquaculture and fisheries production, are you targeting the same demand and supply chains? Are they targeting the same demand and supply chains? Um, is it all domestic demand? And are capture fishers switching to aquaculture in these states where declines are observed? Or is it new aquaculture players? This was a lot. <laughs> I can break it down if somebody wants. I think they're trying to see the leakages between the, the fishery side and the aquaculture side. Holly. Yeah, maybe uh, May we can we can double team on this one. Um, yeah, so one one of the things is trying to establish these interactions. So there's new kind of theory that's being developed to try to understand how this works. Um, economics obviously has um, garnered most of that and, and the interchangeability of product is what you're describing. In terms of interchangeability um, for a given state, we do not have that information. Um, there has been some work done by people like Frank Ash um, and Dave Love looking at that potential for interchangeability. And one of the things that emerges um, in especially the aquaculture fishery sector is that the more common or more identifiable the species is, um, for something like salmon, you can get that interchangeability. Um, or if it's very broad, like whitefish, you can get that interchangeability. And then it starts kind of separating out and having a bit separate markets to some extent. In terms of fishers to farmers, that's a much more complicated question um, that has even less information um, than kind of the market interchangeability side of things. Um, but that's something that is emerging in, around a concept called blue transition. So it's obviously related to interchangeability and viability of a particular sector um, emerging from another, like fisheries to aquaculture. And we're, we're trying to build out some of that theory with empirical evidence. And so that is really the case studies that are going to be um, digging into those potentials, because we see some evidence for it at the global level. But now we're kind of trying to dig in um, at a much more granular scale. May, I don't know if you want to follow up. Yeah, what Holly said was super spot on and I can speak for California and Haley is actually doing an entire project looking at these fisher to farmer transitions. So keep an eye out for that. But, um, and maybe she wants to speak more on it as well. Um, but yeah, the scope of my project particularly, I'm not sure which uh, one you were referring to, but I'm not necessarily looking at um, sources of demand or where this production is going. I was just looking at um, production, like what is being pulled from the ocean. And in California, particularly where we don't have fin fish production, we only have bivalve production, you're less likely to see someone change from being like a halibut fisher to an oyster farmer. So there's just a little bit less overlap in terms of industry there. Um, but Haley might be able to speak a little bit more on those transitions. Yeah, so a uh, big focus of my dissertation is sort of when of this transition between fishing and farming. And um, actually, uh, uh, Bob Rowe commented that sometimes there are ways in which this area is really gray. Um, 
farms would, will be seeded with wild, will be seeded with wild seed or um, wild fisheries will be supplemented with hatcheries. And that kind of blurs the line between what's fishing and what's aquaculture. And it's not always well defined um, in regulations. Usually these are very distinct, but in practice, there's some blurring. So um, as far as finding where um, declines in fishing is observed and replaced by aquaculture is, is like a really convoluted answer because um, a lot of practices aren't specifically fishing or farming. And this is especially clear in, um, or especially blurred in shellfish um, where the reality of, of fishing versus farming logistically can overlap a lot. But so a really good question. <laughs> Very good question. And I think Haley, we'll stick with you on this one to start with. Um, so. Any estimates or guesses on how big the market for aquacultured oysters and other shellfish can get in the U.S. and beyond shellfish, what about finfish? How big can the market get for yeah. finfish and shellfish? For yeah, very large. Uh, I'm, I, I don't have a number for that, but certainly larger than it is currently. Um, in fact, mo a lot of the product that is consumed in the US is farmed. Um, I think it's like three of the four most commonly consumed species are all farmed. It's just that we bring them in from other countries. So based on the studies that Becca and Holly and Sarah have done showing that there is um, ample space, um, suitable space to, to grow our marine aquaculture industry and that Americans are already eating farmed seafood just from other countries, that would follow that there is a lot of room for domestic growth in marine aquaculture for finfish and shellfish. Yeah, and I think where that gets tricky, particularly for finfish, is a lot of the farmed seafood that's imported is like quite cheap. <laughs> and so whether we can um, farm substitutes in the US at that same price point. Um, so that's where it gets a little bit trickier. But, um, but you know, there's also large markets for more like premium fish that, so it, there's not an easy answer to that. And that's certainly outside the scope of this particular project, but an, it's an important question to think about for sure. Okay, um, some long questions. Okay, how, ooh, this is an interesting one. How standard is the definition for marine aquaculture among states and how did we define it for the majority of our studies? Holly, do you wanna take that one? Sure, yeah, the, it depends on um, time and where you are. So, Again, I'm gonna just call on May because I know, and and I should say May is in my lab, so it may seem like I'm picking on her, but it's more of just an artifact of being my PhD student, I think. Um, so yes, it it will it does differ, um, and we do see evidence of how that does impact um, what we see and visualize within the data. So May, if you want to speak to the California example. Yeah, this question is near and dear to my heart because I often find myself wondering what what is aquaculture in this sense and it changes among states amongst countries and so it's very hard to track down, which is why we were going at it from a rigorous approach of looking at the data. Um, but there's blurred lines there as well, and as Haley was saying earlier. Um, there's a lot of overlap between these industries, there's hatcheries, there's sustainable um, uh, conservation programs where ranching is occurring and release and catch and so there's just so much overlap that's happening and it's all called different things in different places so one of the main takeaways that we were calling for was kind of finding a way to make this consistent amongst the states will and define it in policy or in governance will really help data collection and everything else that we were talking about. But broad answer, no, it's not really regularly defined um, in this context. Okay. Uh, is there data available regarding whether production is staying local um, so I'm, I'm assuming she means whether or not we're actually consuming it locally or we're exporting it. What does that data look like? Ooh, it is messy. Um, 
Yeah. And, and by no means am I a trade expert. I just work with uh, people who are uh, proficient in, in the trade data. Um, but working with people like Jessica Geppert or Dave Love on these types of questions, um, in particular in the United States or, or in a given location, um, it, it ends up being quite convoluted. For instance, um, the information on what's staying and where, it usually only has one step removed from the original kind of wholesale attempt of that commodity. Um, and then the kind of where that path goes thereafter um, gets quite convoluted and lost, especially as it gets more processed. Um, and so one of the things that that ends up being kind of a, a good indicator of that level of complexity is that we don't even have a, a delineation in the trade data that identifies farmed versus wild. Um, in this process. So being able to understand exactly where all those things are going proves very challenging when we don't even have that level of granularity. And there are people, like I said, that are working on trying to get better approximations of that and, and have published some recent works in that as well. Um, but it is, it's, it's, very, it's very messy um, is probably the best, best description. All right, well, with that, I'm sorry to have to end this year because there are still some more great questions. But as I mentioned at the intro of this webinar, uh, we will be following up with summary responses to some of your questions, um, as well as a recorded version of this webinar. So thank you all so much for taking the time. Thank you to our team and our speakers. Thank you to everyone who took the surveys and provided data. Um, have a great rest of your week. Thank you, bye. Thanks everybody. Thank you.